So, okay. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, as I say, I'm Rob Fall Walker and uh, Priscilla Alderson. Uh, we're gonna be the two hosts for this series of lectures. Uh, there'll be 10 lectures throughout the rest of this term. They'll be at the same time every week. Um, just the first thing, I guess, is just an apology. If, if anything goes wrong um, in this first session, then hopefully uh, it will resolve it quite quickly. Um, but we're, uh, we're thrilled that there have been over 300 people signed up. Now, I don't think that there are going to be 300 people turn up this evening, uh, but we've already got, um, we've got 121 people uh, logged in already and more people still joining. So, um, which is really incredible. When I first spoke to Priscilla about this last term, she uh, had huge confidence that we'd get plenty of people and we were sort of talking that we might, that we might have 30 or 40 people. Um, I thought we might get about six. Um, so uh, it's, it's kind of phenomenal, I'm totally blown away. Uh, by how many people have signed up. Um, it obviously shows, shows that there is interest in critical realism uh, from people all over the world. Um, and I think that's a really, really important thing, uh, not just for the field, but as many of you will know, for the, the seriousness of critical realism. Critical realism is a serious endeavor. So this is an important thing for the world as well. Um, the uh, just on the logistics of the sessions, these are, we've listed the sessions to be an hour and a half long. We're aiming, we're aiming for an hour, we'll probably run over a bit, but we decided to do it an hour, an hour and a half long rather than an hour and then run over with people missing out because they had to go and, you know, go on to other meetings or deal with children or whatever. Um, so we may well finish early and that will apply for, um, for all of the sessions going forward. Um, so this reading group is really a continuation of there's been a reading group that was first set up by Roy, by, by Roy Baskar, um, one of the founders of critical realism, um, a couple of decades ago. And um, uh, I personally attended the, the reading group in 2018. I don't know if a few people here present today, uh, I met you that, there at the time. Um, Roy sadly died in 2014, um, so I never met him, but those of you who were involved in the reading groups prior to, to, um, to that, and even when I was uh, on the reading group in 2018, his presence was, was very much felt because many people there had attended the original reading groups with him. Um, the, the, the reading group sort of, as with lots of things, uh, ceased to function over the last couple of years as a result of the pandemic, um, but we're, um, but we, you know, we're, we're back now. Um, I think one of the um, really nice things about this is, this is that Roy wrote in his uh, posthumously published book in the Nice and Common Sense about how a lot of the world's troubles will be resolved by technological solutions like video conferencing. So it feels like this is, uh, he was ahead of his time in talking about that and wasn't to know quite how much it would change the world so quickly. Um, for me personally, the reading group was revolutionary for my research, and I hope that it will be revolutionary for your research too. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about that and just refer you to a few books that might be helpful for you throughout the course. Um, there's no there's no need for you to buy any of these books, um, but I'm just going to give you a little background of how they how they help me and that they might help you in this uh, throughout the course as sort of background reading. Um, when I did the reading group in 2018. It was being run by Priscilla, who you'll meet shortly, and also by Gary Hawke. And Gary's book, The Order of Natural Necessity, um, move that back a bit, um, is an incredibly useful book. Um, it's, Gary puts it together from interviews that he carried out with Roy um, before he died. And there's a huge amount of detail, it covers all, all stages of critical realism. Um, and in incredibly easy to digest format. I think largely because a lot of it comes from uh, the interview transcript. So uh, that means that it gets away from a lot of the more sort of ac academic um, phraseology, I suppose. And it's a very easy read, that one. And, and that was, for me personally, that was my, my real introduction to critical realism. Um, the other really useful book, and I know a few people who are present have already seen on this call, um, I've already recommended this to, to them, but is uh, Enlightened Common Sense, which was Roy's posthumously published final book. 
um, edited by Mervyn Hartley. And um, as Mervyn says in the in the preface, um, things to, to paraphrase it, Albert Einstein, things should be made as simple as possible, but not any simpler. And that's very much um, what we've got here. This book is complex in parts, but it's certainly as simple as it can be. Um, and it, again, it covers all stages of critical realism. Um, you can, of course, dive in. I've also got in front of me the various Roy's other books, Philosophy of Meta-Reality, Dialectic, Pulse of Freedom, From Science to Emancipation. Um, and for more detail on certain, certain areas of critical realism, you'll probably want to go into those as well. But those two are certainly very good, good books to sort of give you a, a grounding um, in critical realism. The other book, and I'm just going to keep talking through a few more books, um, is the also by Mervyn Hartley, is the Dictionary of Critical Realism. And I know that Priscilla is going to be talking in a moment about how, because critical realism is a, a new way or a different way of looking at the world, there is a new language required. Um, and there will be words, and I know that, I know that some, some people who are new to critical realism will have probably read a few articles in the journal of critical realism and been felt slightly at sea. Um, the, the, the Dictionary of Critical Realism really is a, an invaluable guidebook for that. Um, I, there is, it is available online. If you Google the Dictionary of Critical Realism, um, Mervyn has put it on his, I think it's on his academia profile, you can download a word copy of the dictionary. So if you're just starting out, you might want to do that. Um, but I would highly recommend that as soon as you get a chance, you get your own copy. Because um, I mean, my, I've got this welcome thumbed copy that sits on my desk all the time, and I regularly find myself probably on a daily basis referring to that. So that's your invaluable guidebook. Um, uh, so we, you know, the, I talked talked a bit more about a bit about the, the reading group previously stopping, but we're now back, and the continuity here really is offered from Priscilla, who has been um, doing this for. Um, running the reading group for many years. As I said, there's been a hiatus for the last couple of years, um, but we're now uh, back and seemingly with a vengeance. Now we've got uh, 145 people signed up. So I'm just going to read out um, Priscilla's biography and I'll tell you a little bit about myself um, before just talking to you a little bit about some basic critical realism. Then I'll hand over to Priscilla to, to talk to you for about another half hour and then we're going to have a, an activity at the end. Um, one of the reasons we're, sa we're saving the interactive activity for the end of the session because um, I'm going to be putting you into um, breakout rooms and things like that and I fear that everything might collapse at that point so I'd rather do that at the end of the session rather than the start of the session. Um, so uh, on to just talking about Priscilla. Priscilla who will talk to me in a moment is Emerita Professor of Childhood Studies at University College London Social Research Institute. She's been involved with medical research ethics committees for nearly 40 years and more recently with committees that review social research. She's advised on the writing of research ethics guidelines for a range of medical, nursing, social and psychological authorities. She's researched many aspects of children's lives and rights and from premature babies to young people aged up to 18. She, la she latterly came to critical realism um, I was talking to her earlier, apparently after retirement, Priscilla actually um, uh, came to critical realism and it gave her great insight into research that he, she had already done. Um, and I think you'll notice from Priscilla's biography there that there is a great seriousness to her work. She's addressing real problems in the world, real issues in the world. Um, and if you are um, interested, we'll be referring to this later. This was uh, mentioned in some of the emails that have come to you. This is Priscilla's book. Um, there's a discount code was in some of the emails. Um, I don't think there's going to be much reference to it today, but Priscilla will be referring to it later in the course. Um, now, I'll just briefly uh, tell you about my tell you about me uh, before I uh, go back come, come back to tell you a little bit about critical realism. Um, so I am uh, an ESRC postdoc fellow at UCL at the Institute of Education. Um, I was formerly a teacher for 13 years before um, doing my PhD, which I also did at the Institute of Education. Uh, luckily for the last couple of years, I've been involved in setting up the SOAS uh, Influencing uh, Corridors of Power Project, which was helping to create better connections between researchers and policymakers. Um, and uh, I'll be referring, not today, I don't think, but um, I'll be referring later in the course to 
uh, my book on the emergence of extremism, heavy scare quotes over extremism, um, uh, which uh, will, which is a, a sort of a critical realist discourse analysis, um, looking at um, how we're well, critiquing counter extremism strategies. Um, so that's uh, that's the introduction to the course. That's us, and I'm now going to um, go back to. I'm going to share my screen. Go back to a PowerPoint. Um, with the hope that uh, you'll be able to see, sorry, bear with me. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, PowerPoint. Here we are. Um, and hopefully, is that working? Okay, hopefully you can. Yeah, that was good. Someone nodded. Thank you very much, Susie Goodall. Um, uh, right now, so I'm going to move on. So, this is the first session. So, I'm just going to talk to you very briefly now about the three domains of the real. This is really the fundamental um, thing to understand about critical realism. And that is when we appreciate the world, we consider that um, there are empirical events that we actually experience. There are actual the events that are, that, that, are, that are generated by the mechanisms, the events, the actual events that cause our empirical experience and the real mechanism and structures enduring properties that underlie all of this. And I'm just going to do that in reverse, starting with the real. So within the world, there are real generative mechanisms. You're going to hear that phrase quite a lot, real generative mechanisms. And they result in uh, actual events. Uh, so actual events, the, the, you know, what, what is actualized in the world. And we as researchers are concerned by um, the empirical, so that, that might be our data, or the, the way that those, those actual events are experienced. And as critical realists, what we're really interested in is using the, the empirical data before us to theorize those real mechanisms. And just before I move on and give you an example of how this might work, I just want you to note that in this picture, the real is larger than the actual, which is larger than the empirical, because while we try to access all of the real generative mechanisms in the world through our research, we will, it's unlikely that we will get a full appreciation of all of them. And that's, that's very important that we, we appreciate in our, we try to avoid, and Priscilla's going to talk about this later, we try to avoid ontological monovalence. That is, we try to avoid thinking that what we're look, looking at is generated by a single process. The world is complex and it's made up of multiple different generative mechanisms. And that's one of the things that we need to remember in our research is that we may find ourselves, and that is the, can often be the job of the research to investigate one, one of these particular generative mechanisms. We also need to remember, and I suppose be humble about the fact that there are gonna be many more function that we're not going to see, but we need to be aware of, or we need to appreciate might exist. So I'm just going to talk you through an example of how these three domains of the real might come up in research, and then I'll hand over to Priscilla. So the example I'm going to give you is, you'll probably all be familiar with images like this of forests across North America that have been dying off over the last decade. Um, hundreds of millions of trees, uh, I think 850 million trees I read, have died off, um, I guess, unexpectedly initially. Um, millions of hectares of trees dying off. And over the years, the Forestry Service, the main, main area that they're in is in British Columbia, the Forestry Service of British Columbia were, had a policy of applying fungicides to the soils to kill off the fungus that they thought was competing with the trees. They clear cut any, any vegetation that they felt was competing with the trees. But the trees kept dying. Um, the trees kept dying as a result of climate change. They kept dying as a result of infestations by things like pine beetles. And, but they persisted with this, this process of, of trying to help the trees to avoid competition with other organisms. Um, by clear cutting the, the, the other plants away and by killing the funguses. And that was until this woman came along, Susan Simard, who is a, um, a, a forester and a plant biologist. 
And she devised a number of experiments where she was able to help allow the trees, certain trees in the forest, to uptake certain isotopes, so certain marked molecules, so certain radioactive molecules. Um, and she found that when the trees took up those molecules, so for example, carbon dioxide that had certain markers on it, if other trees in the forest were stressed, the, 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 the marked molecules from those trees appeared in the trees that were stressed. And through carrying out what ended up being decades of research, she established that these molecules were being transmitted through the fungal networks that had been being killed by the fungicides before and to the other trees that were suffering. So rather than these trees all, all competing against each other and competing against the other plants because the, the wish was going ha happening between different species, the forest was, was in fact cooperating. It was functioning like a cooperative society. So all of their work to kill off the other trees, to kill off the fungus, had contributed to killing off the trees. And she's, if you're interested, she's written about it in Finding the Mother Tree. Now, there are a couple of things before I finish to say about this. One is that Susan Simard is not uh, someone who, is, uh, who, who writes about critical realism. But one of the claims made by Roy Baskar and others is that all good science, all good social science as well, is critical realist. We're, uh, we're, we're offering a, a, a way of doing rigorous scientific research. Um, so there is no need, uh, you, know, you can still understand, you can still give critical realist examples from someone who's not necessarily functioning as a critical realist. And the other thing to point out is that I'm talking to you here about cooperation and competition. You know from probably watching videos with David Attenborough with Greta Thunberg that climate change is also functioning on killing is a function a, a, a mechanism that is killing these trees. So that's an example of, of, of being humble with your research, not committing ontological monovalence by recognizing that there are multiple factors at play here. And I'm sure there would be other factors that, that we're not going to be so sure of. Um, and I think I'm now going to hand over to Priscilla. So thank you very much for everyone for being here. I'm going to hand it over to Priscilla and uh, we'll be back with you when she's finished to do our, our activity. So over to you, Priscilla. Thanks very much. Stop sharing. Hello, everybody. And thank you, Rob. It's great to see so many people. Uh, I do hope you enjoy this course. Um, I'm going to put my PowerPoints up. So. Um, um, no, what do I do, Rob? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's right. Um, so if you do uh, either at the top or the bottom, it should yeah. say share screen. Sorry, share screen. Oh, yeah, yeah. share screen. Yeah. Great. Um, here we are. Share. Hope this is going to work. And um, I just need to... Um, Yes, it's working, Priscilla. Uh, thank you, Chris. It's lovely to see you here. <laughs> Chris, is, Chris is one of the originals who attended the course when Roy was running it, didn't you, Chris? So very much appreciate you coming here. I want to try and put it on full slide and um, I'm not sure if I do it on this one. It's, it's going to work with moving them. Um, so, and also, um, Mm. There seem to be things in the middle. Are you finding that there are things sort of blocking your share screen? Oh, is, uh, is this okay? Is it working okay, do you think? I, th I think it's about to start, so we're just waiting for it. It should, should appear once it's appeared on your screen. Should be. You, you, you can't see it then? If I, I may, if hmm? you would press F5 on your keyboard. F5? F5 yeah, that should enlarge on your screen and then use the arrow buttons to go forward and backward. Give that a try. I've done five, but I can't see arrow buttons. And um, So I, I think, Priscilla, because this, this yeah. happens, why don't you just stop sharing and start again? And that, that works before when Stop it's... share. Yeah. Yes, yes. And then, come, then share again, and I think it might work. Share again, yeah.
um, <clears throat> the trouble is there's um, these black things in the middle of um, where I could press. Oh dear, well, I'll have a go anyway. Uh, can you see it? No. Uh, we're sort of on the, on the wrong page. I, do you want, I could start, do you want me to share a PowerPoint and then you can talk over it and I'll move it on? Okay, should we do it that way then? Yeah. Let me, let me just find yeah. it. Um, um, just to be saying then that um, Roy um, started the course in 2007 and um, he developed critical realism in the 1970s and I've listed some of his first books, A Realist Theory of Science, which was Critical Realism and the Natural Sciences. And can you see that particular slide with the books on? Yes. Great, great. Um, here we are, is that better? Um, so, and then the possibility of naturalism that looks at how the social sciences can be mu much more like the natural sciences than we thought. Then moving on to dialectic, which we'll be doing later in the course. And Plato, etc., is about how we've been stuck into ways of thinking uh, for two and a half thousand years following Plato. And critical realism challenges these. And one of the difficulties of beginning to learn critical realism is undoing some deep, deep ideas that we um, hang on to. <clears throat> and then um, Roy ran the reading group. Now, um, he wasn't alone, of course. There was a group of people that kept meeting. And another prominent critical realist was Margaret Archer, particularly known for her work on structure and agency and culture. And I've listed some of her early books to show that she too was thinking in the 1970s about critical realism. And then she um, moved on to deepen her work on structure, agency and culture. Uh, I would recommend the 2000 book, Being Human. Margaret is a very good, clear writer. Um, and um, the third one, who Roy is also met, um, Rob has also mentioned, Mervyn Hartwig and his dictionary. Now, what we hoped to do to make the most of Zoom was to have a bit of Roy talking, but we tried um, clips of videos of Roy talking on our Zoom and it didn't work at all well. So instead, I have put um, a link to a five minute video of Roy saying what's critical realism, and you could um, link onto it later on this evening, perhaps, or later on so that right should we do the next one are you doing it now rob or am i you're you're, you're muted you're doing it so i think I'm you doing just it. right on. so did that did this work can you see the next one yes we can yeah oh great Carry great on. right now david graber who came much later to critical realism but is very well known for occupy um we are the 99 percent and Professor of Law at the School of Economics. And maybe some of you have read his, among his books, his debt, the first 5,000 years. Anyway, at the launch of Gary's book with Roy, which Rob has shown you, David said of Roy, Roy Basco was a great inspiration to me because I felt no one else was really taking on the big philosophical questions in a way that was simultaneously radical and commonsensical but at a profoundly high theoretical level. In the 20th century, he was one of the most important thinkers in the philosophy of science and social science in philosophy. He would come up with one profound high-level idea, one grand theory that would be worth a lifetime's work for any other major thinker, and then expand and change his ideas more than once. Right, so having introduced for um, Roy and the course. Let's get back to everyone attending. And this is mainly for beginners or for people who've had a go at critical realism and would like another bit of help. And at first, critical realism, I certainly felt like this, can be like rock climbing, hanging on the, in there really hard, really difficult. Is it worth it? And um, this, this, these 10 meetings, our aim is to help you onto the ladder of critical realism, just the first few rungs. I think it's um, a lifelong journey and I'm, I'm never going to get near the top. And up, higher up there are the philosophers on whose ideas we are depending. But we're really going to concentrate on 
uh, understanding the basic ideas and how we can interpret them and apply them to research. Now, coming back to social science, uh, a lot of uh, social science feels like disconnected pieces of the jigsaw. We um, sociologists uh, tend to be quite proud of the paradigms we work in and quite critical of some of the other paradigms our colleagues are working in. And um, someone has compared us to um, an orchestra of soloists, whereas of course what we desperately need is some coherence and cohesion and some harmony. Um, in the sage um, television uh, news and information, uh, we get the scientists, but we hardly ever hear from sociologists, do we? And maybe that's because we haven't got a coherent enough discipline. Whereas we're going to suggest that critical realism can bring different kinds of sociology together. So, in a way, critical realism can help to fit the pieces together to show you the, the puzzle on the lid, although, of course, it will never be finished. Now, we want to talk about theories, and theory means a way of seeing. It opens and closes our vision. There are all kinds of theories. One obvious ones are sexism, racism, colonialism. Often they close people's vision, and people think that they're being neutral and normal, and don't realize that they're working with very powerful theories. So it's most important to try to be aware of what theories are influencing us so that we can be in charge of them rather than them guiding us subconsciously. So first of all, critical realism isn't another kind of sociology. It's a philosophy of the natural and social sciences. It's a toolkit for researchers. And as Rob said, it's a language. There are many, many words, um, and in Mervyn's dictionary of over 500 pages, <laughs> there are lots of profound definitions. Now, some people are put off critical realism because of all the terms. But remember that if you were training to be a doctor, you'd be facing hundreds of strange terms for anatomy and the kinds of medicines and all sorts of things, wouldn't you? If you're going to be a carpenter, a lawyer, a plumber, any any, any new learning does involve new uh, language. And we want to um, give you the tools and the dictionary help. Um, another thing is that quite a few of the books, um, a couple of mine, like the health one that Rob showed, do have um, summaries at the end of the main words with very simple meanings. So um, you could have a look at them as well. What does critical realism do? Well, among other things, it helps us to strengthen our analysis, clarify uncertainties, resolve contradictions and confusions and disagreements among social researchers, connect different or opposing theories, methods and disciplines. It helps us to engage in research that explains as well as describes, like Rob has shown you about um, why are the trees dying and how do the trees connect? Um, the unseen, usually, explanation. And it can increase the strength and validity of our work and its power and relevance to policy and practice. Um, I was researching for about 30 years before I came across critical realism, and it really made me appreciate the value and the importance of what it can add. Now, as I said, critical realism is not a research method, it's a philosophy and it's an underlaboring. It's a way of preparing the site, helping the real construction workers, the researchers, by getting things ready, clarifying things for them. John Locke, the philosopher said, it is ambition enough to be employed, be employed as an underlaborer in clearing the ground a little and removing some of the rubbish which lies in the way of knowledge. Now, this is practical, everyday working philosophy. And then, with the help of critical realism, you can then start your research as the main worker. Um, now, I'm going to go through seven uh, beliefs, tenets of positivists, um, the empirical researchers who are interested in facts and measuring. First of all, there's the assumption that the detached observer, researcher, observes objective, self-evident, value-free facts. 
and these are set apart from their social context, often as separate variables. For instance, when you have massive surveys of thousands of people and then you read the reports and they're all run through the different variables, you won't um, know about any of the actual individuals. They will just appear really as numbers, anonymous numbers, won't they? So when we do our reports, um, our facts are independent, pristine and the same. Whoever observes reports or reads about them, like an x-ray or an email, you send it out. Um, here we are talking and we're expecting all the 300 people who've signed up to um, hear the same words and see the same sights. Number four, um, therefore the um, ideas, the facts, the images have essential inherent qualities and a stable lasting reality that transfers out there in the world. It can exist in data that are unchanged across time and space. And it can be enshrined in words, meanings, images, neuroscans, statistics. Number six, social and natural science facts can be used to prove general laws, replicable findings, and reliable predictions. And number seven, evidence-based findings yield self-evident conclusions about causes and effects to support effective policy making and problem solving. We've seen it all the time in our nightly news that the scientists present the facts and then the policy makers make the policy and they're supposed to be completely separate and different. And examples of this research are lab experiments, psychology tests, exam results, generation four cohorts, surveys of views and experiences and demographics and statistics. Now, um, you could sum them up as positivism is the object, detached object and the objective scientist. And when that transfers from natural science into social science, social positivism, it's also called scientism. The idea that we have to use the natural science approaches in our social science. Views are turned into facts and we follow in the tradition of the top four comp and Durkheim. So those seven uh, um, tenets are actually the opposite to the seven tenets in interpretive or hermeneutic research. A lot of you will know what hermeneutics means, but for those of you who don't, they're about the interaction that enforces and reinforces attitudes and beliefs. So for example, imagine the adult saying, oh, you poor needy child, I will give you food. And the child said, oh yes, I'm hungry, I need you help to help me. Or the adult says, oh, you strong, resilient child, together we're going to solve the problems. And the child said, yes, we can. And people tend to pick up on these cues and respond to them and reinforce them in a hermeneutic dialogue. So hermeneutic sees people, objects and events as constructed through negotiated interactions, hermeneutics and perceptions. They are within specific social contexts, cultures and meanings, so they vary enormously from place to place, quite unlike the idea that you can transfer essential data. And so the phenomena we look at in our research are contingent, they're context bound, they emerge from context. They have few or no essential inherent qualities. Um, people might say a child is a completely different kind of person in um, working Africa from in school in um, England, for example. And there are no general, lasting, universal reality truth or morals that transfer intact across time and space. They're understood so differently in different contexts. And without these fixed realities, it's hard to compare or transfer meaning, to generalize or connect causes to outcomes. And so connections between data, conclusions, recommendations and policy seem tenuous. Now, um, we can imagine um, the journalists and the policymakers' frustration if they say, well, we've got the pandemic, what do the public opinion, what do they want us to do? 
and um, interpretive sociologists will say, well, one group wants this and another group wants that, although they change their mind later if you ask them a different question and a third group wants something. And of course, in a way, all this is true, but is it su sufficient? So to summarize the interpretive, um, it involves the interactive scientists. We ask particular questions that evoke particular answers. We're reflexive and we're aware of the views and the context and the shading denotes people's background, all the things that make us who we are. And then towards another, the further end of um, social constructionism is postmodernism, where things sort of shade and fade into very, very highly contextualized. And, and some people say there are no such things as facts or truths. So each of this, if you look at it later on, you'll see that each of the one to seven tenets actually contradict the other, the other. And one, a sort of hyper-realist, facts are over-believed in perhaps. And the other is hypo, under-realist, um, weak, faint, um, and realities and facts may even be denied. So um, what can critical, re oh, before I go on to that, there are two other very important kinds of theories that we all work with. And most people are functionalists. They believe that on the whole society is like a beehive, that the things function for the common good. And um, it, what we want is more efficiency, research about what works, utilitarianism, and if we have deviants, we need to exclude them, them or reform them so that society can function most efficiently. Now, in contrast, critical theory, which is linked to critical realism and is a much more minority view, is that, no, there's a lot of conflict in society and not everyone benefits. Often, some groups benefit at the cost, very much so, of the others. And that we're all a bit like overcrowded trees, struggling, competing for more space, light and air and water. But um, um, Roberts made me realise another meaning in this because of his earlier talk on trees, that also critical theorists do believe in solidarity and in working together for change, which will benefit the majority. Um, and um, Instead of seeing protesters as deviants who must be reformed, we value protesters and whistleblowers as people who are pointing out the problems and saying, yes, we need to change. So critical realism follows Marx's idea that we should aim to change the world as well as to interpret it. Now, um, Rob has mentioned to you a bit about being and knowing. Um, and it's an, like the, the empirical, actual and real. This is another absolutely basic critical realism idea. Um, both of the above traditions tend to collapse being into knowing. They turn things into thoughts. So ontology, our living and being, into epistemology, our thinking. So lived experience become narratives or discourse or statistical variables. And this is called the epistemic fallacy, when the ontology is collapsed and reduced into the epistemology. Um, so if things are hard to understand or prove or to see, their existence may be doubted. Um, when positivists um, have problems with their data, very often they want to clean up their data or look for more rigorous methods. And when interpretives, interpretive, this are so wondering and worried about what they're finding, they tend to look for deeper understanding in better theories. Whereas critical realism says both of those are important, but we also need to look back at the original reality that we were researching. <clears throat> now, I'm going to talk a bit more about the empirical, actual and real, and a rainy day, which is a good news for gardeners, and um, bad news if you're having a wedding. So we have very subjective views about rainy days, don't we? And at the empirical level, our impressions are of many falling raindrops, maybe the patterns between them when the wind blows, our sensations, the images and evaluations and memories and making sense of the experience. 
which interpretive researchers are very interested in. At the actual level, there are actually raindrops falling. Um, and um, we could examine the patterns, they uh, went how they fall, the variables, the constant conjunctions, the correlations. But critical realism, unlike the other two approaches, says we must look at the real. We must often look at the unseen causal mechanisms shown in their effects. What does, why do the objects fall? Gravity, the unseen, unproven theory. And it's rather like the pandemic. Uh, we can collect lots of empirical data about how people feel about it and reacting to it. We can collect actual data about numbers of infections and um, hospital admissions and sadly of deaths. But at the real level, we will be looking at why is there a pandemic, the virus, how does it spread, and also why are certain groups much more vulnerable to the infection than others, and that will be for reasons of poverty, overcrowding and so on. We need to look at these causal mechanisms too. Um, uh, there's an example here about um, a poor family's daily life. So we will look at the empirical, the family's impressions, sensations, evaluations, their memories, how they make sense of their experience. Um, there's the actual, the events, the people, the poor housing, the food banks, the income levels. And then there's also importantly the real, the unseen causal mechanisms shown in their effects of social class, inequality, ethnicity, gender, generation, power, how the austerity politics and economics, these unseen invisible forces are influencing families' daily lives. Here's another idea of the three levels of reality. Here's the floods with at the empirical level, people trying to cope with it. At the actual level, looking at how deep the, and wide the floods are. And at the real look, level, looking at why has this sudden flood happened? It may be massive rainfalls, but it may be industry um, discharging huge amounts of water suddenly into a river and flooding downstream. And we need to look at all three of these. Um, as I have said, uh, all three um, paradigms, interpretivism, positivism, and critical realism, look at the empirical. Positive is particularly strong on looking at the actual, which interpretivists tend not to do. They're much more interested in people's reactions to events. But on the whole, only critical realists um, and look at the, the real. Um, Evidence-based um, research insists that things have to be visible and that stops them looking at the unseen real causes. They can only look at the effects. So all of the three paradigms are very important. They can be complementary. They don't need to be in conflict as long as they're seen in this broader picture, not taken each as one that will um, do the lot. Um, they're each one third of this big picture. Um, now, behaviorists and positivists would say you must only record what can be seen and proved. Like you can say the man is kneeling, but you can't say he's begging, apologizing, praying, meditating, doing yoga. Whereas critical realists and interpretivists would say, well, the most important thing is to know why he's kneeling. <laughs> what does it mean? And so through these 10 weeks, uh, we're going to do the critical realist work of looking at the unseen below the visible surface or the evidence. And as Rob said, um, monovalence is about the present, the visible, the immediate. And polyvalence, monovalence meaning single value, and polyvalence meaning many values, also looks at the unknown and the unseen and the mysterious. And we're going to show you ways of doing that. Now, Rob mentioned that we're going to have an activity and do you want to um, talk about it, Rob? 
Um, sure, yeah, because I've, I've got a, uh, another, another PowerPoint to switch to. So if you could right. stop sharing, I'll go to that. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Um, so I'm just, yeah, hopefully you can now, now see me. Um, so thank you very much, Priscilla. So I'm just looking through here. Um, thank you very much, Priscilla. That was, uh, that was brilliant. And there's a, a huge amount to digest. So I hope everyone, I can see a few people frantically scribbling notes. Um, but I, I hope that that was uh, enlightening, to, enlightening to some people. Um, a lot of that was, there was a lot there, but it was also very clearly. So thank you, Priscilla. Just one thing I wanted to mention that anyone who's on this, uh, this call who is new to critical realism may have been slightly dumbfounded by um, both my mine and Priscilla's reference to basic critical realism. When we talk about basic critical realism, we're not meaning that you should immediately understand exactly what we're talking about, because this is easy. Um, basic refers to one of the, the first stages of Roy's development of critical realism. Um, as David Graeber talked um, earlier, the quote that we were given, um, Roy developed, had, had three stages of critical realism, and basic was the initial um, phase of critical realism that he developed, and later on uh, in the course, you don't need to know what these mean now, because we'll be explaining, we'll be talking a bit about the next stage, which is dialectic critical realism, and then moving on to the philosophy of meta-reality. But at the moment, when we're talking about the real, the actual, and the empirical, we're, that's, that's what, that, when we talk about critical realism, that's what we're sort of focusing on. Um, now, I'm just going to find, um, yeah, I'm just going to share again and talk to you about our activity, and we've, we've got plenty of time, so we probably will finish in pretty good time. Um, now, here we go. Um, so hopefully you can now see the screen. Um, which I, oh, there we go. I can click through there. Um, so what I, what we wanted you to, sorry, what we wanted you to do initially was just to get you focused on your own research interest. Could you just, if you've got a, a pen and piece of paper, then, then all the better, but otherwise you can just have a think about this. If you could note down, um, all of these things that I've got written here, because we're going to put you into breakout rooms in a moment. I'm going to try and put you just into breakout pairs. And the reason I want you to just get these ideas down um, is that you're not going to have very long. I'm going to give you about five minutes. So you're, you're going to want to quickly expa explain your research. Um, so if you've got these things written down, you can quickly um, just tell the other person what your research is. Um, and I'm then going to give you an activity and ask you to think about, I'll put the activity up in a moment, actually. Um, but the other thing, just to, sort of a slight warning to say, because we've got so many people, we've got 150 people on the call at the moment, um, you're gonna, you're about to meet someone that you may well have, you probably haven't met before. Um, if you find, if you find that you're talking to your kind of your research uh, area field kindred spirits, and you're gonna want to talk again, can you prioritize getting some contact details off them, getting an email address off them? Because it's going to be almost impossible for us to kind of connect you up again if you if you do lose contact with them. Um, so sorry about that. Sorry we can't be better organized than this, but um, it, it, it could be a great frustration and we, don't, we just don't want you to have that frustration. So once you've got written down name, the, the title of your research, your research question, I should say that not all of you are going to be PhD students. So you might not have a title or a question but perhaps just your, your interest would be, would be a good one, uh, one of your research interests, um, subject area, your sampling techniques, method that you thought about, um, aims and the purpose of research and the place where you live or work. Um, so then when you've got that written down, um, what we're gonna ask you to do is just to, for your topic, um, and this is gonna be, this is really a thinking exercise. We're not asking you to give something in that's gonna be graded because this is a very difficult, task to be thrown into. Um, arguably, arguably, if you filled in these boxes, you kind of, you come to an end, essentially come to an end point in your research. So, um, uh, well, although it's never finished, obviously, but um, so have a think about the empirical, what's the empirical in your research? What's the actual? And what is the real as well? Maybe, maybe in your research, you're trying to discover what the real is. Um, so I am now going to try, and uh, I'm just gonna stop sharing. <laughs> Rob, can I, can I just say so? Somebody's asked, um, can we share everybody's emails, which would be so sensible and it would be helpful. But I'm afraid that the GDPR um, rules mean that we can't do that. So it has to be people actually volunteering between individuals. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I think it's just we've got so many people that 
the permissions would get a bit too complicated. But um, I mean, I think as as is in in the modern network networked world, if you just note down someone's name, you can probably find it again. Um, and if you do note down someone's name and you can't find them, then you can always email us and we can arrange for you to be in contact that way. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you five minutes. Um, I'm hesitating here because I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to try and give you five minutes in pairs. Uh, you have five minutes from the time you, you find yourself in these rooms. Um, I'm guessing that Priscilla and I will also be in a, be in a room with, with random people. Um, so, uh, and then spend, spend a, a few minutes talking about that. Um, and then we'll come back in. If you could, we're not going to have a chance for everyone to write down to, to, to feedback uh, verbally so or orally. So if you could um, write down your empirical, actual and real in the chat, then that'll give us a little bit, a, a little bit to discuss at the very end before we wrap up. So I'm now going to try and put you in uh, crit record room. Um, uh, sign automatically. Um, now I can't. Sorry. Um, um, so just trying to find work out the number of breakout rooms. Um, okay, so there should there'll be two to three participants per room. So I'm going to put you in them now. Okay, see you, see you in five minutes. Is there anyone here?
Is there anyone here? is being recorded. recorded. That that works so well, Rob. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> you're, you're mute. You're muted, Rob. Yeah, that's going back here. Um, Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I was getting a message to say that my microphone wasn't working, but it's as it is now. Um, okay. So ho hopefully, hopefully everyone got someone to talk to. I think I'd managed to. Um, uh, one person, Charity, was left out on on their own, so I managed to join her. Um, and I hope hope no one else got got left behind. Um, I think if if I can see there's a few um, a few things in the chat, but um, I think rather Priscilla, would you, do you want to um, do you want to talk talk a little bit more? 
or should we wrap it up there? Because I think we've got too many people, unfortunately, to just have a sort of a, a free for all discussion. But is there anything that you'd like to say sort of before we finish up? Not really, no. Okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I'm, I think we're going to wrap up. Wrap up. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much for all attending. Um, I just I can see that some, there are some notes about um, giving our permission to put re emails and research to be passed around the group. Um, I I'm afraid that I'm just going to hold my hands up and say that we're not prepared for the to deal with the admin of quite so many people and managing quite so many permissions. Um, because we'd have to, to start the process, we'd have to finish it and get everyone's permission. And I can't foresee that we're going to get permission from 300 people, um, uh, given, particularly given that 100 people aren't, aren't even here to be able to do that. So I think I'm afraid that's a non-starter. Um, I will look into if there's another way that we can uh, meet up. Someone's mentioned on LinkedIn. If anyone wants to set up a LinkedIn group, then that would be great. Um, there is the there is the Critical Realism Research Network on Facebook. Um, a few people have joined from that. So if people want to chat on that, they're able to. But I'm saying that with some hesitancy because I don't want to compel people to have to join Facebook to be able to communicate with each other. Um, so if there are if people have got suggestions for good ways of, of, of linking up with each other, then that'd be great. If anyone sets up a LinkedIn group, then uh, Feel free to email me or Priscilla, and we can share it with everyone so that everyone can uh, can join up. But other than that, it is uh, six minutes past seven. Um, we were listed as finishing at half past, but the aim was to to be to finish finish uh, within the hour if if possible. So that'll be the same format for um, for the remaining sessions. So um, without further ado, I think that's uh, probably us done, and we will see you all this time next week. So thank you very much, and thank you so much, Priscilla, for your um, uh, very excellent uh, exposition of the exposition of the basics of critical realism. So thanks very much, all, and bye.